Well, welcome back. I hope you had a wonderful Easter. Um, got together with your family, maybe probably just your immediate family, but had a good time just celebrating the, the wonderful truth of the resurrection. I hope that you had a chance to watch our videos. I'm Pastor Dan, Bill Dillmans, and myself, and we're encouraged and blessed by those. And I wish we could have gotten together and, and celebrated as we normally do, but hopefully it was a kind of relaxation and blessing and encouragement for you. We're continuing our way through the Olivet Discourse on these lessons for Wednesday night, and we're at the last section. We've covered the whole sermon, and we've come to the end, and we're ready to kind of finish it off. Um, but it's important to understand what this discourse has really been all about. It's concerned with the second coming of the Son of God. And all Israel's looked forward to the coming of the Messiah when he would put an end to all opposition and establish the nation of Israel. And blessings would spill out from them to the nations of the world. And it'd be a glorious time of blessing in which the land would prosper, everything would be fruitful, and, and families would multiply, and, and blessings would spill out to everybody. No one would be sick, everyone would be healthy. It'd just be a wonderful time a blessing and they longed for that day and a time in which Israel would be exalted over all the nations of the world and all the nations would come and give them respect and honor them as their king ruled over the whole world and this is the messianic kingdom that they look forward to and everyone longed for that time to come but it was delight because their Messiah finally had arrived, finally had come, and they rejected him. They crucified him, and he died, and he rose again and ascended to heaven. That's what we just celebrated this past week, the fact that Jesus Christ did come the first time, but he was rejected, and he laid down his life for the sins of the world, and he rose again from the dead, but he said he's coming back a second time, and he's coming back to establish his kingdom upon this world. And when he comes back the second time, don't worry, there'll be no opportunity to reject him and nobody's going to miss it. He's going to come. And for all those who accept him, they're going to be part of this glorious kingdom upon this earth. And so the point of the Olivet Discourse is because he's coming back and he's coming back in glory and the whole world will will see him and he's going to establish his kingdom, you need to be ready. You need to be waiting for the return of the Lord. Because you don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen at any time. And so be prepared. Live in light of his coming. And he's warned them repeatedly of this important fact. But there is one more point about the kingdom that must be stressed. Entrance to this coming kingdom is exclusive. Not everyone who survives through the horrible trials and difficulties and sufferings of the tribulation period will be permitted to enter into the kingdom. So survival through the tribulations is not enough. Now Israel thought just simply by the fact that you know you made it through that you'd be part of this kingdom. But he says, no, you need to be ready. You need to be prepared. And people from all the nations of the world need to be prepared. Because not everyone who survives will enter into the kingdom. There will be a judgment of the nations prior to this. And only certain people will be allowed to enter into the blessings of his kingdom. Well, that's what we need to begin today. So, turn your Bibles to Matthew 25. We're going to start at verse 31. But before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon this time of your word as we look at the last portion of the Olivet Discourse. Help us, Lord, to grasp the truth that's here and to recognize the importance of our living in light to the fact that you are coming back someday. And we need to be ready. And so I ask your blessing upon each one, Lord, and just give us ears to hear and eyes to see the truth and hearts that yield to it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a judgment that will occur prior to the kingdom. That's the first point I want to make. It's in verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. 
Well, it's not going to be like his first coming. His first coming, he came very privately, secretly. He was born in a, a manger, in a stable or a cave. Um, only few people were aware of his arrival into this world. It was not with a great noise and celebration. Yeah, the angels came and appeared, but it was to a private audience. And so most of the world did not know. In fact, practically the whole world did not know of his coming. But the second coming, the whole world will know. He'll come in glory. It will be in the heavens. Everyone will see it. No one can miss it. And that's the point he's been making out of a discourse. There's going to be no question when the Son of Man comes the second time. All of his holy angels shall be with him. There will be this angelic host to accompany him when he arrives. Daniel 7, 13 through 14 talks about this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, there's a word actually used, Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, as his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So this is this coming, the second time, to set up this kingdom. And he's coming glory. And he'll sit upon his throne of his glory. Right now he's been exalted over everything. But you see that the right hand of God the Father on God's throne. Now he's looking to the time when he'll come to this earth and sit upon his throne, which is the, the throne of David in Jerusalem, and he's going to rule over this whole earth. That's talking about that coming kingdom, that throne. And all the nations will come and give him his rightful glory. All nations will bow to him and recognize that the king of Israel is the king of the whole world as he's upon the throne. Well, when that happens, there's going to be a dividing of the nations. That's verses 32 and 33. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them from one another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. All the nations shall come before him. It means all the individuals of those nations, every person. And he's talking about those still alive at the end of the tribulation period. And they're going to all come and stand before him. And the question is, who among those people shall be part of his kingdom? Because not everyone who survived through the tribulation period will be allowed to go into the kingdom age. Only certain people. And so there's this judgment beforehand. And he's going to separate the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Because sheep and goats don't mix well. This is a reference to raising sheep in ancient Palestine. Uh, we often see sheep and goats as very different because they look very different with the flocks that we're familiar with. But in the land of Israel, sheep and goats look very similar. And from a distance, it's hard to tell them apart. And one thing that makes it clear which are sheep and which are goats is even though they look very similar, they act very different. Um, sheep are very peaceful and docile and just kind of stay to themselves and eat and take it easy goats are aggressive they will attack and pick on the sheep and they like to climb and do all kinds of things and so they don't mix well and so shepherds would often separate them they separate the sheep from the goats so they could sleep at night otherwise the goats would be tormenting the sheep and so they understood that they, they acted differently very different characteristics and you could tell them by their nature by the way they were but there are only two groups. The whole human race is going to be divided into two groups, sheep or goats. This is not the white throne judgment. In the white throne judgment, people will be allowed to enter into the new heavens, new earth, and be with the Lord forever. And those who are condemned permanently are cast into the lake of fire, and that's the final judgment. That will be at the end of the tribulation period. It's not the beam of judgment that's going to occur before the Mary Supper Lamb where believers are given the reward of greater responsibility and positions in the kingdom due to their faithfulness prior to this. 
It's all about those who are going to be allowed to enter into the kingdom age, the thousand year reign of Christ upon this earth. And so there's going to be a distinction made, a separation. And first of all, he talks about the blessing of the sheep, starting at verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, enter the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, and in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Well, these are the ones to inherit the kingdom. Now the Son of Man is the king. His kingdom has been consummated. He set up his throne. And he's ready to begin ruling on the earth for a thousand years. And all Israel has believed when the Lord comes back, all of Israel will have put their faith in the Messiah, all those who survive to the end, and they're gathered to the Lord. And this is already occurred in chapter 24, verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, which is believing Israel from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And so they're all gathered together to be there for the establishing of his kingdom, because he said all Israel shall be part, leaving Israel, that is, part of my messianic kingdom. What we have here is the judgment of the nations. Um, this is really brought out in earlier verses in the Olivet Discourse. In 24 verse 9, Then shall they deliver up to you to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So the term nations, ethnos, is alluding to the Gentiles, who are to be part of the blessings of the kingdom. All Israel believes and is saved. And it's part of the kingdom. But what about the nations? Because some of the nations believed and some did not believe. And only the believers shall be part of this kingdom to come. But the way in which they are recognized as believers is interesting. He has the nations come before him. And they make their you know, case. And the long-awaited fulfillment of the promises of God are about to be realized. Um, now this is an important thing I need to stress here too. This kingdom has been promised from the very beginning of scriptures. He promised to Adam and Eve. He says, you know, the, the seed of the woman shall set things right and the blessing shall spill out from them into the whole world. There's a time which God will make it right. And they look forward to this promised one to come who would set things in order. And then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all promised that through them would come one who would be the one through whom blessings would spill over to all the nations of the world. And it'd be the becoming Messiah. The promise was made to David that it'd be one of his own descendants that would sit upon the throne and rule over all the nation of Israel and blessings would spill out from them to all the nations of the world. It's a promise given over and over again to the Israel through the prophets of this messianic age to come. And now it's finally here to be realized everything in God's word that's been promised is now to be fulfilled. A great time of blessing. It's a picture of the, the scroll that we see in Revelation that we've been studying that has the seven seals upon it. And once those seven seals are broken, all those blessings and promises can be experienced and the fulfillment of them is about to happen. And that's in the kingdom that's about to arrive. And so this is a very exciting time. It's a time which all the promises of God are about to be realized and fulfilled. And the question is, who's going to be able to enter into the kingdom and experience these things upon the earth, among those who are still alive at this time? And so the nations come before him. And the base of their admittance is that they have ministered to the Lord. 
When he was hungry, they fed him. When he was thirsty, they gave him something to drink. When he was homeless, they housed him. When he was naked, they clothed him. When he was sick, they cared for him. When he was in prison, they visited him. Um, they met his, met his various needs. Of, you know, When he was in trials and difficulties and hardships, they, they ministered to him and they helped him. And the question of the sheep, they're kind of um, perplexed by this. Uh, they have no recollection of actually doing this for the Lord. I mean, they would have wanted to, and if they had the opportunity, they would have loved to. But they don't remember ever having done this for him. And so they ask him, well, when did we ever do those things for you? And the Son of Man answered them and said, um, when you did to the least of one of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. Now, when he says the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me, this term brethren has been a reference to believing Israel throughout the book of Matthew. Those who put their faith in the Messiah, who he says, those are my brothers and those are my sisters. And it's particularly the, the people of Israel. And so during the tribulation period, when the 144,000 out there witnessing and sharing the gospel with the nations, particularly, but all believers, you know, Jewish believers, there was an effort to kill them by the Antichrist and to destroy them and to persecute them. But these people took them in. They helped them. They cared for them. They, they helped to preserve the believing people of Israel. And he says, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. That's which, the way in which they demonstrate their faith in the Messiah, the truth that they proclaim. When you do it to them, you've done it to the Lord. That was a tangible demonstration of faith. Because God's concerned about his people, particularly his people Israel. He's concerned for all of them, even the least of them. And whenever you care for or minister to one of them, you cared for me. Because the Lord identifies with his people. He's a shepherd who cares deeply for his sheep. And when they looked out for them and they cared for them, they demonstrated their faith in the truth. They recognized that these people were God's people. And because of that, God says, when you did it to them, you did it to me. But the goats were quite different. Look at verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we hungered, and a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, believing in Israel, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Well, these survive the tribulation, but shall receive permanent condemnation. See, the kingdom was prepared for the righteous in Christ. Chapter 25, verse 34. Then shall the kingdom say unto them, On his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. It's for them. But who are these righteous? Well, interestingly, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10, through 10, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. There's a certain standard by which people will be part of the kingdom of God. Now you have to understand, it's not that they're part of it by works, but genuine faith demonstrates itself in actions. And you know what they are by the way they behave. That's the point of sheep and goats. Sheep act like sheep. Goats act like goats. And goats reveal their nature by their aggressive action, or in this case, inaction. 
it's interesting in this passage that it's those who did these kind deeds for God's people when they were hurting that show themselves to be sheep, truly part of the people of God. But the goats refuse to do anything for the sheep. I mean, for those who are suffering, going through the hardships. They don't help them out. They don't feed them. They don't give them water to drink. They don't visit them in prison. They have absolutely nothing to do with them. They reject the people of God. They're part of the people of the world. They're oppressing them and refuse to give them any help or deliverance. And they will go to the place prepared for the devil and his angels because they've aligned themselves with the devil and the angels. The devil, and I shouldn't say angels, fallen angels, we mean here, his angels, they have been opposed to the people of God from the very beginning. They've sought to wipe out the Jewish people. They wanted to destroy them. When Jesus was born to this world, they were the one, Satan was the one who prompted Herod to, to kill all the little babies in hopes of killing the Messiah. Um, they've always opposed the people of God and have sought to destroy God's people from the very beginning. And so by their actions, these people have aligned themselves with the oppressors of the people of God. They've joined the ranks, if you will. And on this basis, they are condemned. They didn't minister to them when they were in need. They had the opportunity but they refused to give any kind of assistance, any kind of help. No, it was not because of what they did. It's because of what they did not do. Now, you looked at that first list I read from Corinthians, and you might say, well, I don't do all those wicked and evil things, but do you refuse to help the people of God? Are you one who's joined and united yourselves by your inactions with the persecutors and the oppressors of God's people? Then you are part of them. And look at the answer of the Son of Man. When you refuse to help my people, you have refused to help me. Because they are the people of the Lord, and he identifies himself with them. And so there's two destinations. The goats go to everlasting punishment, the sheep unto eternal life. Now, as I mentioned, you can tell the difference between sheep and goats by how they behave. Jesus mentions this earlier in the book of Matthew. He mentioned that you will know them by their fruit. You can tell what people are by their actions. And their actions during the tribulation time reveals their true natures. Because those who knew and loved the Lord would be concerned about the Lord's people. Jesus, as a shepherd, identifies closely with his sheep. Paul learned this lesson when Paul was a persecutor of the church. The Lord appeared to him graciously upon the road and revealed himself to him, but he said to them, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Now, he wasn't persecuting Jesus directly. He was persecuting the people of Jesus, believers. But Jesus, I identify with them. And what you do to my people, you do to me. And so during the tribulation period, those people who sought to help out and protect God's people, showed an acceptance of the truth about Jesus and belief in him by putting their own lives on the line to help them. And God recognizes a demonstration that they were people of faith. But those who offered no assistance to the people of God, who refused to help them when they were being persecuted and mistreated, aligned themselves with the persecutors and the oppressors and revealed that they had no faith in the Lord. Is that's the basis upon which he determines who will enter the kingdom and who will not. Now, there's a couple things I want to point off out by way of conclusion to this series. We tend to think of the Lord's return individualistically. In other words, when, I, when people normally talk about the rapture or the sanctum of the Lord, they always talk in terms of whether or not they personally are ready. And they see the rapture as more of an individualistic event. I'm going to be raptured. Maybe these people over here are going to be left, but it's just me and the Lord. Okay, I'm going to go to be with him. Now, they'll recognize the fact that those who've been dead will be raised, and other believers will be gathered to the Lord, but it's more me being gathered together to the Lord. That type of thing. And even with the second coming, we talk about one will be doing something and be taken away in judgment, the other left to be allowed to enter the kingdom. And let's talk about individuals. 
And it seems to me at the end of Matthew's account, he wants to drive home the fact that he's not just talking about individuals. He's talking about people as a group. That when the Lord is coming back, he's not just coming back for individuals, he's coming back to establish a kingdom of people. All united under his lordship, under his leadership. And for his kingdom to be a kingdom of righteousness, it has to be righteous people who put their faith in him, who are there, who care about each other. So when the rapture occurs, it's not that he's coming for Pastor Schuler or for you. He's coming for his bride, the church, in the rapture. He's coming for his people to gather them to be with him, to have a marriage supper lamb, that we might be united together and, and prepared to have a part in the kingdom to come. And when he comes back at the second coming, at the end of the tribulation period, he's coming for Israel, his people, to usher in the kingdom age. But not only just for them, he's coming to gather up believers from all tribes and all nations that together they might be part of his kingdom. So both of them are really corporate events. And sometimes I think in our emphasis upon the individual's decision for salvation, which is true, we lose the fact that we're a part of something that includes others, and we're in this together. And second of all, um, all this is intrinsically tied to how we treat one another. In other words, he's bringing out this big concern that it's not just about our relationship with him. When he talks about watching for him, being ready, it just doesn't mean having my heart right, having put my faith in Christ, which is very important, and you know, avoiding sin in my life. There's a sense in which he says what he's also looking for is how am I treating other believers? How, how am I concerned about the people of God as a whole? Because the Lord is concerned about the people of God as a whole. This kingdom is to be a kingdom of blessing. Now, for a kingdom to be a kingdom of blessing, it is determined by how people treat one another. Okay? That's very important for a kingdom to be filled with righteousness and be a good kingdom. And that's why it cannot be a, a kingdom of peace and blessing and joy and well-being with a bunch of goats in it. With people who are sinful and rebellious and stubborn and defiant. Sorry for anyone who's raising goats. I'm not trying to downplay goats. But the point is the difference he's making between sheep and goats. There has to be people who have been reconciled to God by faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but also who have the same heart and concerns as the Son of God, who care about his people. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's a sign of somebody who's right with God. But the second is a love for one another, a love for God's people. That's the only kind of kingdom that can be a blessed and joyful kingdom. A kingdom must be made up of sheep who love God and love one another. So let us live now in preparation for that kingdom by genuinely having a concern one for another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this truth. We look forward to your coming to usher in the kingdom a time of blessing, a time of joy for all those who really are right with you. And Lord, one of the signs of someone who's right with you is a love that you place in their hearts for others. They cannot see people being mistreated and hungry and naked and hurting and know they can help them out without trying to do something. That characterizes your people. And so I pray that as we look forward to your coming, that we may realize that it's not just about me, but you're coming for a people. And we need to be concerned about other people. And so Lord, fill us with your love, love for you, and love for one another. In Jesus' precious, precious name I pray. Amen. Well, this will finish off our series on all of it discourse, and I'm looking at starting another um, series of lessons, if you will, but more topping talk about different topics about what we believe and important scripture passages kind of pick up each one so i encourage you to keep on joining us on these wednesday night lessons and uh, keep serving the lord and keep loving one another 
they'll know we are Christians by our love.